which is on PrEP. It is part of the abstract-driven sessions under the epidemiology and prevention science track. Uh, my name is Tamisai Chinengo, and I work for UNFPA in the regional office for Eastern Southern Africa, which is based in Johannesburg, and I lead the youth team um, in that office. So, je m'appelle Tamisai Chinengo, je travaille à UNFPA, au Bureau Régional, au Johannesburg, and welcome to everybody. So, this afternoon, we have three speakers. Uh, we have Dr. Almahadi Altini, who's a medical doctor specializing in, in international public health and humanitarian action. He works with an organization in Mali called Sotura, and he'll be sharing with us the work that they have been doing um, with oral prep. And then we will hear from Ms. Laila Sheirha. I hope I got that right. <laughs> She's a data manager with um, University of California, both Berkeley and San Francisco. And she will speak to preferences for PrEP implementation models among adolescent girls and young women vulnerable to HIV in Tanzania. And finally, we'll hear from Ms. Constance Mongwenyana, who is from South Africa. She's a research associate um, in the Health Economics and Epidemiology Research Unit at the University of Fitz. And she will be speaking to us on barriers and facilitators of accessing pre-exposure prophylaxis, that's PrEP, services among young people in Gauteng in South Africa. So we will hear first from Dr. Almahadi, and he's going to speak um, in French. He'll share in French. So I hope you have, uh, if, you, if you are not um, able to understand fully in French, you can use the, um, the headset so that we can get that going. Uh, just a minute if you want to grab a headset, and then we will start. Okay. So I'm going to... Uh, Give you Dr. Almahadi. Je vous donne 10 minutes pour présenter vos recherches, so you can take it away. Thank you. Okay. Bonjour à tous. Merci beaucoup. Okay. Ah bon? C'est possible? Oui. Bon, c'est pas un problème. Oui, merci. Je peux le faire? Uh, our, uh, our, sorry, our challenge is the mics. Uh, bonjour à tous. Et alors, euh, le plaisir est pour nous de partager avec vous notre expérience dans la mise en œuvre d'un programme de prévention contre le VIH axé sur la prophylaxie pré-exposition. Durant tout, toute la mise en œuvre de ce projet, et nous avons développé des stratégies axées sur la communication en nous focalisant sur la promotion et l'utilisation de la PrEP, en assurant ainsi à nos bénéficiaires une tranquillité de l'esprit face à la peur de contracter le VIH. Slide, please. Alors, très brièvement, l'ONG Soutra est une des associations pionnières de lutte contre le VIH au Mali. Elle fait partie de la société civile de lutte contre le VIH au Mali et elle fait partie de la, lutte, de la société civile de lutte contre le VIH au Mali. Alors, Aujourd'hui, aujourd nous allons vous parler surtout des stratégies que nous avons mises en œuvre pour mettre en place les programmes euh, de prophylaxie pré-exposition. Alors, au Mali, Soutra intervient sur un projet qu'on appelle le projet EPIC. Alors, littéralement, le projet EPIC signifie atteindre les objectifs de l'ONU-SIDA afin de contrôler l'épidémie du VIH. Et sur ce programme, Soutra intervient dans quatre régions du Mali, notamment la capitale, la région de Bamako, la région de Sikasso et la région de Ségou. Alors, au niveau de ces zones d'intervention, nous avons six cliniques communautaires qui sont dédiées à l'offre des services VIH aux populations vulnérables. Nos cibles sur les projets EPIC sont les travailleurs de sexe, les hommes qui ont des rapports sexuels avec d'autres hommes, les personnes vivant avec le VIH, leurs partenaires sexuels et leurs enfants biologiques. Les données que nous allons partager avec vous aujourd'hui sont ici euh, des systèmes d'information du projet euh, qu'on appelle les 10 di Tracker ou les Colochi. Alors, au Mali, vous savez, nous avons une épidémie du VIH de type euh, généralisé, mais elle est plutôt concentrée chez un certain groupe de population, où euh, au niveau du pays, en 2020, une étude a donné une prévalence de 12,6% au niveau des hommes qui ont des rapports sexuels avec d'autres hommes et de 8,7% au niveau des travailleurs de sexe. Alors, face à ces défis, et au-delà de toutes les stratégies qui sont mises en œuvre pour augmenter le nombre de cas positifs au VIH, L'air mis sous traitement arrivé et l'air rétention jusqu'à la suppression de la charge virale. Et 
conformément également à l'engagement du pays dans la dynamique d'élimination du VIH du SIDA d'ici 2030 et également conformément aux recommandations de l'OMS, le pays a décidé de mettre en œuvre la PrEP comme outil supplémentaire de prévention pour réduire les nouvelles infections. Slide. Alors, au Mali, jusqu'en en juillet 2021, le pays n'avait aucun document en faveur de la mise en œuvre de la PrEP. Alors, c'est sous le leadership du ministère de la Santé, à travers sa représentation qui est la cellule sectorale de lutte contre les SIDA, et avec les soutiens financiers du PEPFAR à travers l'ISAID, et également avec l'assistance technique des FHI 360, que le pays a pu finalement développer des documents normatifs en faveur de la mise en œuvre de la PrEP. Ces documents comprenaient les guides de mise en œuvre, des matériels de formation, les outils de communication et également eh, des aides mémoire. Une fois ces outils mis en place, et les mêmes eh, partenaires ont soutenu la formation des formateurs et après une, de, une dissémination de tous ces outils a été faite au niveau national. Et les acteurs communautaires et les acteurs terrain ont été également renforcés sur euh, la mise en œuvre, le processus de mise en œuvre de la PrEP. Slide. Alors, comme je le disais tout à l'heure, au niveau des Soutras, qui est un partenaire de mise en œuvre du projet EPICO au Mali, comment est-ce que nous avons procédé Je disais tantôt qu'on a développé des stratégies qui sont axées sur la communication et cela nous permettait de créer la demande au niveau de, de, de la communauté. Alors, cette, demande, cette création de demandes est faite à travers la promotion et l'utilisation de la PrEP et également en utilisant des messages spécifiques et précis. Et cette activité est faite par des cadres communautaires qui sont impliqués dans l'offre des services VIH et également par les prestataires de santé. Au-delà de ces, de ces stratégies, nous avons développé une autre stratégie à côté qu'on a appelée PrEP Champion. Et cette stratégie s'est révélée très efficace parce qu'elle nous permettait d'utiliser des MSM pairs éducateurs qui sont des modèles influents en matière d'adhésion de la PrEP on les utilisait pour amener en fait euh, leurs pères qui sont éligibles pour la PrEP. Et ça nous a beaucoup aidé puisque ça a augmenté de façon considérable euh, l'utilisation de la PrEP au niveau de cette cible. Alors après, une fois que la demande est créée et que la personne est éligible, elle n'est pas directement initiée, il y a une évaluation qui est faite à la mort pour voir effectivement si la personne est éligible ou pas. Alors pour être éligible, il fallait que le client remplisse un certain nombre de conditions. D'abord, la PrEP, comme rappel, c'est une stratégie de prévention qui est proposée à une personne séronégative. Donc, il fallait que la personne soit séronégative d'abord et il fallait que la personne soit face vraiment à une situation de risque élevé d'exposition à l'infection par le VIH. Au-delà de ça, il fallait également que la personne ne présente aucun signe aigu en faveur du VIH et surtout, surtout ce qui est important, que la personne ait la volonté d'initier, de commencer la PrEP en fonction de la prescription faite par les prestataires de santé. Et une fois toutes ces conditions réunies, la PrEP est lancée et une fois qu'elle est lancée, le suivi, un calendrier est établi pour euh, le suivi. Alors, nous avons offert deux types de PrEP. Une PrEP continue qui consiste à une prise quotidienne du médicament, qui est offerte au MSM qui était en permanence à un risque élevé de contracter le VIH, et la PrEP à la demande qui était offerte au, au MSM qui avait des risques occasionnels d'exposition au VIH. Alors, comme je le disais, une fois que la PrEP est offerte au niveau de la clinique par les prestataires, un calendrier de suivi est mis en œuvre et les visites sont établies. C'est au cours des visites qu'on s'assure du fait qu'effectivement la PrEP est suivie selon les prescriptions et que l'adhérence est correcte. Et maintenant, ça permettait également de renouveler les stocks des MSM qui étaient sous PrEP. Et également, à côté, on organisait des activités qui aidaient à l'adhésion à la PrEP. On faisait des activités, des rencontres mensuelles et ça, ça a beaucoup renforcé l'observance de la PrEP. Slide. Alors, comme je le disais, au début eh, du lancement de, et de la mise en œuvre de la PrEP, si le projet EPIC, uniquement la cible MSM était intéressée. Et à partir de septembre 2021, nous, nous avons commencé avec notre cohorte de MSM positifs qui, qui comprenait eh, 2032 MSM. Et 99% de ces MSM ont pu être évalués. Et parmi eux, seulement eh, 16 n'étaient pas éligibles. Okay? Et tout ce qui était éligible, nous avons offert les services de PrEP. Et ça, c'est une, une demande de, du projet, l'offre systématique euh, du service PrEP. Maintenant, à tous ceux à qui on a offert le service PrEP, au moment de l'introduction, 42% ont accepté effectivement de commencer la PrEP. Et parmi eux, 67% ont opté pour une PrEP continue et 32% seulement ont opté pour une PrEP à la demande. Et pendant notre suivi, nous avons constaté des cas de séroconversion. Slide. Alors ici, vous voyez facilement, nous avons fait, ça c'est le résultat d'un suivi de, de la cohorte des MSM qui était sous PrEP continue pendant six mois. Et on a observé ce qui suit, on a vu que 
Au bout de six mois, il y avait une diminution progressive du nombre de MSM qui ont commencé la PrEP continue. Et cette diminution était plus, légèrement plus significative chez les MSM jeunes que chez les MSM de plus de 25 ans. Slide. Alors, ce que nous retenons, on va back. Slide, slide. Again. Slide. Voilà, donc ce que nous retenons, c'est qu'à l'issue de l'évaluation de notre corps des MSM négatifs, 99% étaient éligibles à la PrEP. Et ce qui montrait effectivement que c'est une intervention pertinente pour les MSM. Alors, au moment de l'introduction, c'est-à-dire au moment où on a commencé la mise en œuvre, près de 50% avaient initié la PrEP. Donc l'acceptation était là, elle était bonne. Et la PrEP continue était l'option la plus utilisée. Et c'était l'option qui était eh, recommandée par le programme, puisque au vu de son, de son efficacité. Alors, le suivi de six mois nous a permis de constater une diminution progressive du nombre de MSM qui étaient sous PrEP continue. Et c'est là, la cause était le problème d'une observance. Et cette cause était multifactorielle. Et des cas de séroconversion ont été identifiés. Et ces deux cas de séroconversion ont été identifiés parmi les MSM qui étaient sous un régime de PrEP à la demande. Ce qui nous démontre une fois de plus que la PrEP continue est la meilleure option pour obtenir une protection maximale. Slide. Voilà. Okay, donc, en termes de leçons apprises, nous, nous avons retenu que sous le leadership vraiment du ministre, le leadership du ministère de la Santé a permis au pays d'avoir des directives pour la mise en œuvre de la PrEP. Les résultats de sous ont effectivement montré que la PrEP était acceptée par les MSM et elle est mieux offerte lorsque l'utilisation est meilleure lorsque l'initiation est faite en communauté et l'adhérence est encore meilleure lorsqu'elle est faite au niveau des cliniques communautaires. Slide. Alors, en conclusion, nous disons aisément que la PrEP est une intervention qui est efficace et que nous devons envisager et de proposer dans le cadre d'une prévention combinée contre le VIH. Et elle devrait permettre au programme national de réduire de façon notoire les nouvelles infections. Maintenant, il faudrait voir dans quelle mesure est-ce que nous, avons, nous allons développer de nouvelles stratégies pour euh, lier aux difficultés de l'observance. Slide. Je ne saurais terminer sans euh, remercier. Slide. Ok, je souhaite terminer ça remercier nos partenaires financiers qui sont les PFAR et l'ISAID, nos partenaires techniques qui sont FAG360 et la CELI sectorielle de lutte contre le VIH. Et je remercie également la conférence ICASA et aussi je remercie tous mes collègues qui sont venus me soutenir ici. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, Dr. Al Mahadi. Um, if you'll allow us, we will just uh, take all the three presentations and then we'll ask questions at the end. So over to you, Lila. Thank you. Okay, while we wait for the presentation, if anyone has a question to Dr. Al Mahadi, he shared with us prep for men who have sex with men. Yes, sir, please. All right, so I have a quick question for you. So your research shows that there is huge acceptance of PrEP among, among MSM, but at the end of the day, one of your slides shows the discontinuations or retentions on the PrEP was very low. So I'm wondering if you collect some data from the patients or from the beneficiaries regarding to some factors which cause them to stop or to discontinue PrEP? Because it shows high acceptance, but low retention. All right, thank you. I'll allow you to digest the question, Dr. Al Mahadi, while we listen to Lila's presentation. I see it's up already. Um, over to you, Lila. Thank you. Thank you. I'm pleased to share with you the following presentation entitled Understanding Preferences Around PrEP Modalities and Implementation Among Tanzanian Girls and Young Women, Adolescent Girls and Young Women, a discrete choice experiment. I would, begin my, I would like to begin my presentation by acknowledging the Youth Advisory Board members, 
healthcare providers, research team from Health for a Prosperous Nation, and our Ministry of Health partner, the many research assistants and researchers from UCSF and UC Berkeley. Um, uh, sorry. Uh, UCSF, uh, UCSF and UC Berkeley, what I present to you today is part of my dissertation and would not have been made possible without these valuable partnerships. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. I don't have to convince this audience that adolescent girls and young women remain especially vulnerable to HIV acquisition. Click, please. As in East Africa in particular. We know how effective oral daily PrEP is. However, there are many documented deterrents to PrEP uptake and retention, including that adolescent girls and young women don't want to be seen as being promiscuous or are already living with HIV. We also know that healthcare providers can provide an extra layer of uh, deterrence and have, uh, they are biased and have lower willingness to prescribe PrEP to adolescent girls and young women. There are newer formulations of PrEP which may address some of these barriers, primarily being seen with PrEP medications um, uh, that are in regulatory review across many countries. However, we are at an opportunity juncture to ensure, to understand what we might do differently to ensure success in the development of the implementation models and rollout of these newer modalities among adolescent girls and young women. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, what did we do? We conducted formative research with three youth advisory boards of 15 to 20 girls each, healthcare providers like nurses who screen PrEP, a screen for PrEP, HIV doctors, and pharmacists who dispense PrEP to inform a discrete choice experiment, which was conducted across 41 wards in Xinyang and Mwanza, Western Tanzania, two areas with a high HIV burden. Uh, we, uh, we used the Tanzanian PrEP screening criteria from the National AIDS Control Program, which included questions about inconsistent condom use, STIs, transactional sex, and intimate partner violence. We included adolescent girls and young women who screened for PrEP eligibility, as well as those who had ever had risk factors for PrEP, given well-documented uh, uh, seasonality of HIV risk. Next slide. We build upon important research, including discrete choice experiments, restricting our sample to those who were screening eligible for PrEP, and we evaluated real PrEP products that were already determined effective and already under regulatory review in Tanzania. This has a direct policy implication. So in collaboration with youth advisory boards and our stakeholders, we evaluated the following determinants. The first was PrEP type, injectable PrEP, click. Injectable PrEP, also known as cab uh, the vaginal ring, or the standard of care oral daily PrEP. Click. We evaluated the screening location where pre PrEP eligibility is assessed, a mobile clinic, a pharmacy, as well as the standard of care HIV section of a public health facility. Click. The refill location, including a mobile clinic, pharmacy, or community health workers. Provider identity, including older or younger females, older or younger males, as well as in any one option. And finally, uh, cost ranging from free, 2,000 shillings, 4,000 shillings, 5,000 shillings, or about $1.75 US. Next slide. So how specifically did we evaluate these options? We used a discrete choice experiment, which I'll call DCE, which is a quantitative technique which aims to elicit stated user preferences over a defined set of choices. So let's briefly review some DCE terminology. Click. Each adolescent girl and young woman was offered an illustrated choice task. Each, we can do two clicks, um, had two alternatives. So we have the choice task, and then next click, the alternative one and alternative two. Within each alternative, you see five options. The five options are called attributes in DCE terminology, and those are the ones that I previously described. Within each attribute are the levels, which are randomly distributed. This is just one mock-up of a task. Each adolescent girl and young woman was offered 10 choice tasks, so they had a total of 20 alternatives. As you can see, once you multiply this by 700 adolescent girls and young women, we have quite a robust sample size um, of alternatives, which is the unit of analysis. Next slide. We recruited and enrolled 696 adolescent girls and young women, so we got very close to 700, and found that alarmingly, 80% of those who were screened were currently eligible for PrEP, yet only four of them were on PrEP, and PrEP knowledge was exceedingly low. The median age was 20, nearly 90% of the participants were Christian, 
and nearly one in three were currently or ever married, and 38% had at least one living child. Over one-third had primary or less education, and about 10% were still in school. Next slide. I'm going to walk through the interpretation of DCE before I get to the results. The interpretation is a little bit, uh, they're a bit particular, so I'm going to take a moment to describe. I used a multinomial logistic regression. Given we're interested in preference weights, I use something called effects coding. Yes, um, effect, preference weights give the preference for an attribute level, such as the vaginal ring, relative to the mean effect of a given attribute. So while this is not very intuitive, let us compare it to categorical coding, where we have a reference group and we always compare categories to that referent group. Effects coding doesn't have a reference group, so we can look at the preference weight for all the attribute levels. We interpret the preference weight in terms of magnitude and direction of the effect relative to the mean value of the attribute level. Uh, a positive preference weight means an attribute level is more likely to be chosen, and a negative preference weight means it's less likely to be chosen, but that, not that it's a negative preference. The larger the magnitude, the more or less preferred the level was. I will present these results graphically, which I think will help us visualize it. Lastly, I will report attribute importance, which helps us understand the weight of each of the five attributes in decision making. Next slide. When we look at the graphic of the results, we will see the attributes in the center, the levels are labeled on the far left, and the axis goes from negative one to one. Zero means a neutral preference. Positive values on this side mean more preferred, negative values mean less preferred. When we look at the first three attributes, what stands out is the strong negative preference for the vaginal ring and positive preferences for injectable prep followed by the oral daily pill. These are statistically significant as the error bars do not cross zero. Uh, next. For, uh, for the screening location, we see a significant negative preference for mobile clinics and a positive but not statistically significant preference for the standard HIV clinic nor pharmacies. Next one. Finally, we did not detect any significant preferences for refill location. Next slide. For cost, we see a significant and positive preference for free prep, decreasing monotonically and becoming a negative preference weight once hitting 4,000 Tanzanian shillings or about $1.50 USD. Finally, for provider, we see a significant positive preference for young females and a significant and negative preference for older males with no significant preference weights for the other identities. Lastly, we asked adolescent girls and young women after they're making, making their choices between alternative one and alternative two, that if they were offered the program, would they actually take up the program that day? And 89% of them said yes, which is promising as though even though these are stated, prompt, stated preferences, the stated interest is exceedingly high. Next slide. Finally, I want to finish by sharing the results of attribute importance. As a reminder, the attribute importance or relative importance helps us determine the weight of each overall attribute, but not the levels within them, so the overall attribute in decision making. We calculate these scores by taking the range of the preference weights within each attribute, so there's five attributes, summing them, and that's the denominator, and then the range within each attribute as the numerator. This quantifies the potential influence of each attribute relative to the total utility. Here, we can very clearly see that modality type and cost are the biggest influencers of decision making, with dispenser identity being somewhat important in screening and refill location, accounting for less than 6% of the total relative importance. This further demonstrates that adding these newer modalities to the market and giving adolescent girls and young women choice in prep options is incredibly important and must happen now. Next slide. You have two minutes. Okay. Smiling. I think I can do it. Next slide. Uh, there are a few limitations to our study. If you recall, we saw that one third of the participants were married, which makes us wonder how much risk for HIV are you at if you're having condomless sex, for example, within the confines of marriage. However, many of these adolescent girls and young women met more than one of the PrEP criteria, and research shows that married women in Sub-Saharan Africa constitute a substantial proportion of incident HIV cases, showing that even marriage does not protect women from HIV. We were not as successful as we would have hoped in recruiting younger adolescent girls in the 15 to 19 range, although they were well represented in our youth advisory boards. So we need to work harder, and we, our, our team, we need to work harder to ensure we get the voices of these younger adolescent girls and young women. We didn't evaluate the dual prevention pill, as this is not under review in Tanzania. However, we included a separate model on it 
to understand pref initial preferences and found that while the preference was high, preference for injectables was still higher. Click. Our main findings is that uh, we did know that preference awareness is low and re it remains the best kept secret. The product type was incredibly influential and injectable prep was incredibly preferred. Cost and provider identity are important factors which underscore the price sensitivity of adolescent girls and young women and their desire for some type of youth friendliness or someone who can understand their circumstances. And it's important to note that there were no dominating preferences in refill or screening location. Next slide. The key takeaways is that adolescent, as ICASA wraps up, if you're going to go home with just a few messages from my research, let it be this. Adolescent girls and young women in Tanzania are enthusiastic about injectable prep, so what are we waiting for? The finding of no strong preference for screening and refill doesn't mean that that doesn't matter. It means that we need to give adolescent girls and young women a diversity of approaches to meet their needs. There's not a one-size-fits-all approach for prep implementation packages, and we must continue to involve adolescent girls and young women in decision-making as we roll out newer prep types. And finally, choice matters. Giving and empowering adolescent girls and young women to make the choice that best fits their needs will help us close the gap on the disproportionate burden of HIV that they face. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Lila. Um, as we're putting up Constance's uh, presentation, I'll come to you for the response to the question earlier. Do you want to respond to the question you were asked? Please, Dr. Al Mahadi. Okay, thank you. Merci beaucoup pour la question. Alors, euh, je vais essayer de répondre si j'ai bien compris. Alors, en ce qui concerne eh, ces résultats que nous avons, je signale que c'est des résultats que nous avons au moment de l'introduction c'est-à-dire la première année de mise en œuvre du programme PrEP. Et donc, en ce moment, il y, a beaucoup, il y avait beaucoup de défis, et des défis qui sont beaucoup liés à l'acceptance, le fait d'accepter la PrEP. Et, et au niveau de notre cible, c'est des gens euh, qui étaient beaucoup réticents au début, okay? et donc euh, ils n'avaient pas confiance et, et à la stratégie. Ça, c'était euh, au début de l'introduction. C'est pour cela que et beaucoup étaient réticents par rapport à ça. Maintenant, pourquoi est-ce qu'il euh, y a eu beaucoup de problèmes par rapport à la forme discontinue La forme discontinue était sollicitée parce que euh, certains MSM disaient qu'ils n'étaient pas permanemment en, dans une situation où ils avaient un risque élevé de contracter le VIH. Okay? Et donc, euh, ils se disaient qu'ils n'ont pas besoin, ils n'ont pas toujours besoin de la PrEP et donc ils optent facilement pour la PrEP euh, euh, discontinue. Maintenant, les autres difficultés que nous avons eues par rapport à, à la diminution du nombre de MSM sous PrEP, les causes étaient multifactorielles, comme je le disais. Certains avaient arrêté parce que et, et, il y a la forme galénique du médicament, parce que c'était une PrEP orale, c'était en comprimé. D'accord D'autres ont arrêté et, à cause des effets secondaires. Et, entre autres, c'était les raisons qui ont surtout poussé certains à arrêter. Et donc, Ça, c'était le résultat au mois de l'introduction. Nous continuons à travailler, le programme continue à travailler et actuellement, les résultats sont beaucoup mieux par rapport au début. Je suppose que j'ai répondu à la question. Thank you, Dr. Mahadi. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Mahadi. I will move quickly on to Constance, if you can make your presentation in 10 minutes. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, my name is Constance Mungunyana. I'm from Hero, South Africa. Um, I'm here to present barriers and facilitators of accessing pre-exposure prophylaxis, PrEP services among young people in Gauteng, South Africa. Next slide, please. As we know, PrEP is an intervention to prevent HIV transmission and literature has shown, has shown its efficacy. Even if PrEP is available, its uptake is low in South Africa. So it is actually important to understand the factors that influence PrEP uptake to promote its, its use. Next slide, please. The aims of our study is to, to describe the characteristics of PrEP services, service delivery models that are preferred by people, potent, by potential PrEP clients. 
We also wanted to understand the barriers and facilitators to accessing PrEP services among young people in South Africa. Lastly, we wanted to contribute to improve access, uptake and continuation of PrEP services by young people in South Africa. Next slide, please. With regard to the study setting, we conducted our study between April and May 2023 in around the city of Johannesburg in South Africa. Our participants were recruited from Indela Behavioral Hub. Um, this is an organization, organization within HERO, which is in partnership with the University of um, Verts, the University of Boston, as well as the University of Penislavia with Penislavia, yes. Within Indela, they launched a behavioral hub. They call it BHUB. The BHUB is a community panel that consists of a group of individuals who have consented and enrolled to participate in behavioral studies. These people are called at any time to participate in these behavioral studies. Our data was collected from five sites, um, which were community health centers. It is a qualitative study which was purposefully sampled. We conducted FGDs among PrEP uh, naive and PrEP experienced uh, young people between 18 and 35 years. Next slide, please. In terms of the study population, we included young adults between 18 and 35 who self-reported that they are HIV negative and they could either be PrEP naive or PrEP experienced. Then we excluded those who were below 18 and above 35, and also those who reported themselves as HIV positive. Next slide, Pete. By the time when we enrolled our participants, the BHAP had like 500 community members, but yesterday on their satellite uh, session, I heard that they are now have recruited like eight, more than 800 um, community members. So they extracted a list of 149 participants for us who particularly were eligible for our studies. 77 of them were males and 72 were females. From that number, we excluded 77 because we could not reach them telephonically. And so we successfully contacted 72 community members. We then excluded those who were not interested those who were over age and those who did not show up for the FGDs. In total, we enrolled 20, 32 participants, of which 26 were PrEP and naive and six were PrEP experienced. Next slide, please. On this slide is just showing how data was collected until analysis. Firstly, we have draw a list for us, we call, screen, and set appointments. Thirdly, we rescreen and conduct FGG. Lastly, we transcribe and analyze the data through in vivo. Next slide, please. Our FGDs were, stratific were stratified by prior PEP use and by gender. We analyzed our data using a team-based thematic approach. Three of our study team members tested reliability of the codes. Next slide, please. Uh, these are the results for our democrat demographics. Most of our participants were males, that is 59%. The mean age of across all groups were 28.2. Majority of our participants were unemployed, sitting at 81.3%. And again, only one person managed to get a diploma, that is, and 97% only attended high school. Next slide, please. These are the themes that emerge from our data. On the left side of the slide are barriers of accessing PrEP by young adults. They said that they have limited knowledge about PrEP and no, there is not much information about PrEP out there. There was a misconception about side effects, stigma, lack of confidentiality, as well as negative attitudes, staff attitudes that served as um, all those served as a barriers to access PrEP by our young people. In terms of the facilitators, they said that if we could have more awareness campaigns and more information provided, that would be a facilitator for them. And also they wish that we could have like combined clinical services, services which means for example, having sexual, sexual um, 
reproductive health combined with uh, PrEP uh, services to avoid long multiple uh, queues at clinics. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry. Can you please go back a little bit? Oh, disclosure as well as um, support from family and friends serves also serves as a facilitator. And of course, uh, the desire to remain uh, negative is also a facilitator. Next slide, please. These are the, some of the comments that were made by our participant explaining to us that explaining to us about their barriers to access PrEP. One of the female PrEP experience participants so told us that she was taking PrEP, but she stopped because at the clinic, they did not give her enough information. It is actually sad to find out that one of a young woman uh, took effort to, to, to initiate on PrEP, but had to stop because they don't have enough information. The other one who is male PrEP naive participant said that he is afraid of stigma from the community and family. Members might think that he is Members must may think that if he's taking a pill every day, that will mean that he's HIV positive. Next slide, please. When these young people um, comment about facilitators to access PrEP, a female PrEP experience said, I quote, I'm taking PrEP because I want to be clean. That is my motivation to take medication, close quote. The other female PrEP naive mentioned that if they could provide PrEP with other treatment plus contraceptive, that will be very much prep, uh, helpful for her. Next slide, please. In conclusion, uh, all these barriers identified need to be addressed. We need to have an approach which will include comprehensive training campaigns. We need, to have, we need our healthcare providers to be trained on PrEP, um, to promote PrEP uptake and accessibility. Again, we, if we address all these barriers and facilitators, our policymakers can increase PrEP uptake for both the PrEP naive and the PrEP experienced uh, individuals. And therefore, the newly in, uh, HIV infections will go, will decrease. Next slide, please. Limitations of our study. We had a small sample and it was because of our participant just didn't show up for our FGDs uh, and uh, or could not be reached telephonically. So findings cannot be generalized. We had a low number of PrEP experienced participants, which is obvious that uh, we, uh, the, the numbers are very low of, of PrEP experience. But uh, those, those that we got, they managed to raise their voice about barriers and facilitators of accessing PrEP. Next slide, please. Thank you so much. We thank uh, the BHAB participants. We thank the sites, the study staff, as well as, as well as the study team. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much, Constance, and you kept to time, which is appreciated. So, colleagues, we've heard three um, studies that have been shared with us, one from Mali, which was targeting um, PrEP for men who have sex with men. We heard about adolescent girls in Tanzania and now young people in Gauteng. Um, and I, what I found quite interesting are the barriers because these are barriers we've been speaking to for so long, whether it's related to adolescent friendly services, whether it's related to you know, ANC services in some cases. And it's interesting that every time we have a new intervention, we seem to meet the same barriers. It'll be interesting to see how we tackle this um, as health systems. But over to you guys for questions. Um, we have about five minutes. So I'll ask that we do ask questions and not make presentations. Go ahead, ma'am. Yes. I would like to thank the presenters and ask whether some of them can be realized des expériences de PrEP avec les travailleuses de sexe. Si oui, quel était le taux d'acceptation de la PrEP à leur niveau et l'adhésion à 6 mois et à 12 mois? Merci. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. I would like to know, in most of our country, those uh, in need of PrEP a key population that are marginalized and even criminalized. I would like to know, 
Mali, how they overcome this barrier. Maybe in other countries, the same thing. Thank you. Thank you. Just one more question, please. There's a lady here. Thank you for giving me the floor and for the wonderful presentation. So I would like to know in terms of parental consent. So because I saw less than 25 years, and so I want to know what is the age, um, when you say less than 25 years, I can say 10 years or nine years, what is the age that you give prep in uh, both of the country? And the other thing is to emphasize on, on, uh, on education. That's why the retention rate just dropped after six months. So when giving the PrEP, we should make sure that we sensitize the patient on the importance thank of you. this. We are thank beginning you. to present. <laughs> thank you very much. So we have three questions. Um, I'll ask Lila to speak first and then Constance and we'll come back to you, Dr. Almahadi, last. I believe two of the questions were directed for... Um, Correct. The question to yourself and Constance was on the age group that you're actually working with when you speak oh, to adolescents. Yes. Um, we applied for a waiver of consent to enroll girls starting at age 15 because in Tanzania, you are um, eligible to receive sexual health services without parental consent if you're sexually active as part of the HIV prevention national prevention program. So we could not enroll anyone less than age 15, even though we know there is sexual debut. Um, and so we that was part of our um, ability to consent. And I believe, um, but I will defer to my Tanzanian colleagues, that at age 15, you're eligible for um, PrEP, I believe. Although that may, I may not be. I, be, I believe so. All right. Thank you, Lila. Um, Constance, do you want to respond to the age group that you're working with? The age group? Yes. Okay, we were we recruited. Uh, use the mic. Okay. We recruited uh, females and males who were aged between 18 and 35, and not less than 18 and not more than 35. Which we, in South Africa, we consider them as uh, young people. Thank you. Right, thank you very much, um, Dr. Almahad. If you can speak to the two, and um, I'll ask that you be quite brief in your response, so we can take one more round of questions. Ok, thank you. Ok, merci beaucoup pour euh, la question. Alors chez nous, comme je l'ai dit, les données qu'on a présentées c'était des données à l'introduction, c'est-à-dire la première année de mise en œuvre de la prep. Et donc sur le projet EPIC, on, on a démarré avec la cible MSM uniquement. Maintenant, après 2021, à partir de 2022, nous avons commencé avec toutes les cibles, y compris les travailleurs de sexe. Et au début, euh, avec euh, la communication qui a assuré vraiment l'acceptation au niveau des tests, il n'y avait pas de problème également. Je ne peux pas vous donner tout de suite un chiffre exact, mais elle va au-delà de 50%. Donc, elle est bien acceptée par tout le monde là-bas. Okay. Maintenant, euh, quelqu'un a posé la question à savoir comment est-ce qu'on arrive à, à initier les populations clés. Okay. Et ça, je l'ai dit à l'introduction. Soutoura, c'est une ONG, euh, une ONG euh, qui travaille depuis plus de 23 ans actuellement. Elle encadre les populations clés. Elle n'est pas la seule euh, association qui les fait, il y a d'autres associations. Mais franchement, nos cibles, ce sont vraiment les populations clés. Au niveau des soutrans, nous avons créé un cadre qui sont les cliniques communautaires où les populations clés se sentent à l'aise, où ils viennent tranquillement et ils ont les services dont ils ont besoin en matière de santé sexuelle. Et c'est ce qui a fait que... Et au-delà de cela, nous travaillons avec eux. Ça veut dire que nos agents communautaires, ce sont des agents qui font partie de la communauté MSM ou TS. Et cela nous facilite nos, nos différentes actions. Et c'est ce qui fait que facilement avec eux, on est parvenu à les initier à la PrEP. Voilà. Maintenant, par rapport à l'âge, au Mali, et, et, comme euh, on n'avait pas assez de temps, au Mali, selon les directives mises en place, la PrEP est autorisée à partir de 18 ans chez nous. À partir de 18 ans, pour une personne qui est séronégative et qui a aurait de contracter le VIH. Je pense que j'ai répondu à l'ensemble des questions. Et on pourra discuter du reste hors de session, si c'est possible. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. I think we have time for just two more questions. Um, if anybody wants to either follow up or ask a new question. Oh, we've run out of time. 
Okay, I had a minute, but it is okay. We will use the minute to wrap up the session and to thank everybody for attending and participating. And thank you to Laila, Al Mahadi, and Constance for sharing the research that you're doing. Very important, I believe, in ensuring that we're able to roll out PrEP and do it well to ensure more young people and key populations are kept HIV negative. Thank you for your time and thank you, colleagues, for participating. Mike in your hand, yeah, yeah. <laughs>
and I'm explaining Zella already because I know I was in touch with her that work. Why is she going to water? Her work is interesting enough. Now, this one.